Actually, I'm uh, Dr. Erin Thompson. Erica couldn't be here today, so I'm uh, presenting uh, in her place. Um, so I'll be talking about the length of myotomy in poem and uh, whether or not uh, tailoring this to uh, manometry results results in uh, improved outcomes. Uh, I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. So achalasia is a rare uh, esophageal motility disorder that is defined primarily by failure of aperistalsis of the esophagus as well as impaired relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, symptomatically, this produces a constellation of symptoms, but often these patients present with dysphagia, which can ultimately progress to intolerance of solids and even liquids. Uh, this uh, constellations of symptoms can be um, quantified based on the Eckert score, which takes into account weight loss, dysphagia, retrosternal pain, and reg regurgitation. <clears throat> the patient's given a score based on the severity and frequency of these symptoms. And for our purposes, uh, any Eckert score less than three is counted as a treatment success, with the max score being 12. So high resolution manometry has developed as the gold standard for diagnosis workup of uh, achalasia. And um, we've been able to classify uh, achalasia based on the esophageal pressure um, topographic mapping um, in the Chicago classification into subtypes, so, <clears throat> and one related um, categories. Type one achalasia, which actually is, uh, you can't see the third picture there, is a classic achalasia with a failure of uh, peristalsis as well as failure of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Type two achalasia, the second picture there shows um, panesophageal pressurization. And type three achalasia, the last picture, uh, actually exhibits a spastic segment of esophagus that can be discreetly measured um, on uh, manometry. Esophagogastric junction outflow obstruction is a related category which uh, shows a failure of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, um, but with pres some preserved peristalsis. So there are non-surgical treatments for achalasia, including Botox injection and pneumatic dilation, uh, but neither of these is thought to be superior to surgical uh, myotomy um, of the lower esophageal sphincter. Heller myotomy has long been thought to be the gold standard for treatment of this disease, um, but it is limited by the amount of intra-abdominal esophagus and the amount of length you can get on your myotomy. So peroral and endoscopic myotomy, or POEM, is a, a relatively new therapy that's shown pretty promising results in treatment of this disease. Uh, advantages are that this is essentially an incisionless procedure. It's done endoscopically. Uh, and as such, you have access to the entire esophagus. So there's really no limit to the length of myotomy that you can create. Um, although. <clears throat> to date, there has been no standardized length of myotomy um, that we have come up with, and there's no real data showing um, whether or not certain myotomy lengths or differing myotomies for subtypes of achalasia can improve outcomes based on subtype. So our objective was to identify whether using our high-resolution esophageal manometry data to inform the length of the myotomy in POEM patients would impact our post-operative outcomes. Uh, our hypothesis was that we would have improved outcomes if we tailored our myotomy based on the spastic segment seen specifically in type 3 achalasia, which could be measured. So we um, retrospectively reviewed uh, data from a prospectively collected database of patients, all the patients that underwent POEM at our institution between January to uh, 2011 and July 2017. Um, included were all patients who underwent both POEM and preoperative high-resolution esophageal manometry and were of at least 18 years of age. Excluded were patients who were diagnosed with an esophageal dysmotility disorder other than achalasia, so for example, a distal esophageal spasm or those patients with a jackhammer esophagus. Our um, definition of a tailored myotomy was one that extended beyond the length of the disease segment as measured on high-resolution esophageal manometry. Our primary outcome was procedure success, as previously mentioned, was denoted as an Eckert score less than three, as well as pre- and post-operative change in Eckert score. Secondary outcomes were length of myotomy, the starting position and ending position of the myotomy, operative time, length of hospital stay, and specifically the dysphagia component of the Eckert score. 
So we identified 40 patients uh, who met our inclusion criteria. Of those, four exhibited classic or type 1 achalasia, 22 exhibited type 2 achalasia, and 14 exhibited type 3 achalasia. When you looked at the groups by achalasia type, uh, and also if you broke them up into tailored and non-tailored myotomy groups, there were no difference between age, sex, BMI, uh, or pre-POEM interventions, which included um, pneumatic dilation, and uh, there was even one, one um, patient in both tailored and non-tailored groups that had undergone previously a laparoscopic Heller myotomy. Uh, who presented with recurrence. Um, and there was also no difference noted in preoperative Eckert, Eckert score, both total or the uh, dysphagia component. Um, the myotomy length was significantly longer uh, across groups in the type 3 achalasia group at 15.7 as compared to 13 and 14 in type 1 and type 2, uh, as well as if you looked at the tailored and non-tailored groups, uh, it was significantly longer in the tailored group. And this just shows that, again, in graphical form, and that uh, the position was significantly higher for the starting position of the myotomy, which uh, contributed to the longer length. Um, and the operative success was uh, equivalent across categories, approaching 90%. So if you looked at just the type 3 achalasia uh, groups, tailored versus non-tailored, um, there was, again, no difference in preoperative characteristics. But myotomy length was again longer in the tailored group. And we also saw a significantly lower post-operative Eckert score in the tailored group as well uh, with the longer myotomy. And this again just shows that in graphical form that uh, the tailored length was uh, approaching 16 centimeters um, and was significantly longer than the non-tailored group. If you did a linear regression modeling between myotomy length and change in Eckert score, which would correlate to um, symptom improvement, and the non-tailored group, we did see a correlation between myotom increasing myotomy length uh, and symptom improvement in the non-tailored group. However, in the tailored group, we did not see that same correlation, presumably because once you have myotomized that uh, spastic segment seen on um, manometry, then there's no advantage to doing a longer myotomy once you have uh, achieved that, that length. So there were several limitations to our study. It was retrospective in design, uh, very small sample size, especially in the type 3 achalasia groups. Um, so it was poorly powered to make conclusions. Um, there was a pretty short-term follow-up. Um, median follow-up was only about eight weeks. Um, it was a single institution. Uh, and I will mention that all the tailored myotomies were done consecutively and after the non-tailored myotomies. Um, so one could argue that, you know, there was a learning curve involved. However, we had done at least 40 poems before all, prior to all of these, so we don't think that's the case. Uh, so our conclusions for patients with non-tailored myotomies, there were longer myotomies correlated with greater, greater symptom in improvement. Patients with tailored myotomies, no coral, sorry, with non-tailored, there was longer correlated with symptom improvement. With tailored myotomies, there was no correlation seen. And for type 3 achalasia, the tailored myotomy was associated with greater symptom improvement. Thank you. I'll take any questions.